This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Russ Capper. Hi, I'm Russ Capper, and welcome to episode number 114 of the Energy Makers Show. Today, our guest, Dr. Richard Lester head of the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, sharing his perspective on the future of energy in the United States, including his strong pro-nuclear position. All of that coming up right after this. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. Our guest now, Richard Lester, professor and head of the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT. Richard, great to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. So, tell us a little bit about the program. Well, the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering is basically about educating the next generation of leaders of the nuclear enterprise, both in the U.S. and around the world. Something MIT has always done well. Well, we try to do it, and we also, at the same time, try to advance the field of nuclear science and engineering, which is particularly an energy-oriented subject with fission and fusion technologies, but it's also to do with non-energy applications of nuclear. Well, and you're also involved with the Industrial Performance Center. What is that? Right. So the Industrial Performance Center is a research center that works on innovation and productivity and competitiveness in a wide range of industries, including energy, but also a lot of other industries, too. Well, energy remains a big topic, certainly in the U.S. and and around the world. Speaking first very broadly, I'd love to hear your thoughts on our energy mix and, and our energy future. Well, our energy future looks not bad at the moment. Uh, Certainly many people are very enthusiastic and encouraged about our advances in oil and gas, unconventional particularly. But if you look at the world picture, and of course the U.S. is part of the rest of the world, uh, part of the world, there are some big challenges, big issues to deal with. And I'd mention four. Uh, One of them is growing demand. We expect demand for energy of all kinds to grow by about 50% between now and mid-century, and electricity demand will probably double by then. A lot of the growth, probably the bulk of the growth, is going to be in emerging economies. That's Asia, South America, even Africa will become a more important player in, in that sense. So we have to find ways to meet that demand affordably and reliably. That's a big deal. Sure. And, and, and some of the others? So a second issue is security, energy security. It's a big as, one. as we increase our demand, more countries are going to be dependent on other countries for supply. And even if the U.S. approaches energy self-sufficiency, which is still a long way off, but we may be moving in the right direction. Uh, For many other countries, that's not going to be an option. And so even though we may not be such a big player, for example, in the Middle East, in terms of our demand on Middle Eastern resources, other countries will be. Sure. And that's going to raise a lot of security issues. The third issue is environment, local environmental effects of burning coal and, and to some extent oil are very, very significant, particularly in countries like China. Right. 
But worldwide, about 3 million people a year are dying prematurely because of local environmental effects of, of, um, of particularly energy use, and that's something that has to be addressed. And where do you find we are today with the debate over climate change? We've seen it ebb and flow. We saw certainly on the run-up to Copenhagen, uh, you know, the email controversy. Where, where do things stand today? So that's the fourth issue, climate. And um, not everyone will agree with me when I make this statement, but uh, the debate about the scientific basis for developing a response, sensible response to climate change, is essentially over. We know that we're going to have to act. The question is how to act, how much we should act. Those are difficult questions, and I don't claim that that debate is over. But in terms of developing a response, we know from the scientific evidence that we're going to have to deal with it. Well, and from your perspective, what are some thoughtful ways for, for our nation to participate in that conversation and to make our own changes? So I think there are three options, broadly speaking. We have three things, or the world has three things, and the U.S. has three things that we can do. One is reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, and particularly carbon dioxide, which is the most important right. one. The second thing that we can do is prepare for and adapt to the changes in the climate that have already begun and that will continue and probably accelerate over the next few decades. And the third option is uh, what is often referred to as geoengineering, actually intervening in the climate system to try to offset the effects of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. There are big questions about the third because right. it's not clear that we really understand the climate system well enough to uh, engineer it. Sure. Uh, before you engineer anything, you've got to understand it. And that's something that may turn out to be very tempting because the costs of doing geoengineering, uh, for example, you know, injecting large amounts of uh, sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere or putting a lot of iron into the oceans to grow algae that absorb carbon dioxide. Those are things that actually, they sound pretty radical, but probably will be a lot less expensive than the other things, decarbonizing and adapting. And so we may be tempted to do some of those things, but the danger is that we will get it wrong. Right. Well, and I'm eager to talk about nuclear. Can I get you to stick around for a little longer? I'd be glad to. We'll be back with more of Richard Lester right after this. Here we are, first quarter of 2013, and the energy outlook in the United States is incredible. In fact, I can't understand why we're not having a national celebration. We should, actually. It's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's been about 20 years now that I had a thought. My thought has been that energy and energy abundance should actually be the most populist of all issues. It should be a Democrat issue. It should not be delegated to the right-wing fringes of the Republican Party, okay, like some people are thinking. Uh, it shouldn't be any different than the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat, okay? Okay, so an interesting thing, too, though, uh, about our sudden abundance uh, of natural gas, it it does have some pretty significant geopolitical ramifications, does it not? No doubt, and I've written about this extensively. Let me, let me just dissect some of these issues for you. First of all, the production of natural gas from shale mm -hmm. is arguably the biggest and best story in the history of, of the American oil and gas business the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, no doubt about that. I mean, this is an extraordinary feat. Um, going back to my high box that I am preaching right now is that this is again, the now use the same word, the quintessentially American character uh, the can-do attitude, innovation, uh, private industry taking the lead, letting the economy function as it does without government interference. You put all of these things together, it, truly shale gas 
should be one of the best stories, not just energy stories, mm -hmm. but one of the best stories that an American would be proud of. Okay, in other words, uh, it's great application of technology, great economic decision making, great can do mm -hmm. attitude. Put a lot of these things, the accolades are just endless, okay, of what happened. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Continuing on with Dr. Richard Lester of MIT, when we left off, we were about to get into nuclear. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on the current state of, uh, of nuclear power. Well. I think looking around, you'd have to say that nuclear is running into some pretty severe headwinds at Indeed. the moment. Uh, we've had, of course, Fukushima, still only two years ago, two and a half years ago, big challenge there. Uh, we have, in addition, uh, in the U.S., a number of nuclear plants having to close for various reasons, including, not the only reason, but one important reason is the sharp reductions in natural gas prices and the difficulty for these nuclear plants to compete in wholesale electricity markets. Which is pretty with, exceptional uh, in itself, I think. Well, it's remarkable. And, you know, in a sense, it's very good news because uh, it means that electricity prices are coming down. Um, a third challenge for nuclear is uh, nuclear waste. Uh, you know, we've not been able to deal with that problem for decade after decade after decade. The government hasn't been able to come up with a, a workable solution. So when you take all of those things together, you have to say, well, is nuclear really going to be able to contribute? But then you look at the problem from a different perspective, and I at least come to the conclusion that without a lot more nuclear around the world, including the United States, we have little or no chance of addressing the climate problems that we were talking about earlier. Well, and when, when you're talking about bringing a nuclear facility online, it doesn't happen overnight, right? So I mean, how long does it take from it, I'd like one to I have one? It takes too long. And that's one of the things that will have to change if nuclear is going to become a big contributor in the long run. Because today, if you were to say, I want to build a nuclear plant, and you were living in the United States, uh, you'd be looking at at least a decade. That's too long. It's far too long. If, on the other hand, you were living in other countries, let's take China, for example, you would probably not have to wait f half of that time. They're building plants in four to five years. One hopes that they're building them well and safely and reliably and so on, and, and uh, you know that will become clear over time. But the... Uh, the need to reduce these very long cycle times, these long lead times, is absolutely crucial for the future success and viability of nuclear. Well, and on the waste issue, what, what are some of the answers, some of the solutions? Well, the solution that uh, the, the government has been pursuing, which is so-called geological disposal, disposing of the waste in underground structures, three or four hundred meters underground, is generally accepted by everyone with a serious claim to technical knowledge in these areas as being viable, acceptable, workable, feasible. And is that Yucca Mountain? Yucca Mountain is the location that the government selected about 25 years ago to be the place we were going to do this. And that's now off the table. What happened? What happened was predictable uh, from the outset. Uh, what happened was that the state of Nevada didn't want it. Uh, they were very clear about not wanting it at the beginning, and they continued to not want it. And even though this is a federal responsibility, and in principle, the federal government has uh, the authority to make something like that happen, as a practical matter, the state and even the local community, which, by the way, in this case was more enthusiastic about the repository than the state government, 
But in any event, the state has, or any state, has many practical means. If they don't want a facility like a waste repository, they have many practical ways to prevent it. And that's what happened in Nevada. You brought up cost. Uh, how, how can we drive down the cost of nuclear? Probably the single most important thing, a, a way to reduce the cost is to reduce the lead time because a big part of probably 80 or 85 percent of the total cost of electricity from nuclear plants is the capital cost. That's the front end cost of building these plants. The fuel cost is very modest. So are the operating and maintenance costs. So if nuclear costs 10 cents a kilowatt hour, about 8 cents of that is tied up in the capital cost. Wow. And if you were, say, to be able to build one of these plants or build these plants in five years instead of 10 years, you would obviously save a great deal in terms of carrying charges, the cost of capital that you incur while you're building the plant. So lead time is important even for reducing the cost of nuclear. What is your take on small scale nuclear or smaller scale nuclear? Small nuclear, small modular nuclear reactors are attracting a lot of attention, not only in the U.S., but around the world. And one of the big reasons for that is because the capital bite for a big plant could be five, seven, eight billion dollars for one uh, project is just too big for all but the largest utilities. And around the world, there are a few very, very big utilities, but actually in the U.S., most utilities are not that big, and they can't uh, afford that kind of uh, capital cost. So the first thing you have there with the small modular reactors is instead of sending, spending seven or eight billion dollars, you may be spending several hundred million or maybe a billion, maybe a couple of billion, but certainly something that's more attainable for uh, electric power companies. In addition, there are likely to be other advantages associated with small modular, and one big one is that you would do most of the building of these plants within a factory environment. Think of how we build ships. Sure. In a shipyard, shipyards are pretty controlled, the environment is pretty controlled, and you know, a big, we don't have too many big shipyards left in the U.S., but if you go to Korea sure. or other Asian countries, you see these ships really being turned out Assembly quickly. Assembly lines, It's almost. exactly right. And you could imagine, and people now are seriously proposing, building nuclear plants in that way, trucking them, essentially, to their uh, eventual location and doing a lot less field construction, which is, you know, less predictable. Uh, and is responsible for some of the uncertainties in lead times and, and costs. So if you can do these things in a factory environment, you're going to probably save some money that way too. Now, Richard, there are many in the environmental community that would agree with your position on climate but might disagree with your position on nuclear. How, how do you resolve that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, a large section of the environmental movement which is certainly of the view that climate is a big problem, uh, is very uh, unhappy with, and many of them completely opposed to, the idea of nuclear as a part of a solution to the climate problem. That is changing to some degree. Uh, we've seen some environmentalists over the last few years reevaluating their position and saying, you know what, if we have to do something about the climate, it's just not clear that we can do it without more nuclear. And the position that they've taken, uh, and in fact, just within the last couple of weeks, we had a group of four very prominent uh, climate scientists uh, issuing a letter to the environmental community saying, you know what, your position on climate and against nuclear is just not viable and you've got to change your minds. I think that will happen more because if you look at the scenarios that some of the environmental community are promoting about dealing with climate just with solar and wind, they're not really, at least to my mind, very credible. No. And 
it just doesn't add up. Well, thank you so much for coming by today. You're Always very fascinating. Welcome. And that wraps our discussion with Dr. Richard Lester. It also concludes this episode of the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson, and we'll see you next week.